uh, good morning and welcome to you all. You're all very warmly welcome to today's lecture on the Pontifical Biblical Commission document, What is Man? by a distinguished speaker, Professor Nuria Kalduk Banajes. I would like to express a particular word of thanks to each of you for attending online today on behalf of the Catholic Biblical Association of Great Britain, of which I am chair. Today's lecture is the third in most recent series of talks commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Catholic Biblical Association of Great Britain, originally founded in 1940 to promote interest by the Catholic laity of Great Britain in the Holy Scriptures and to foster Catholic biblical scholarship in this country. I'm joined on screen this morning to welcome our speaker by three fellow academic members of the committee of the Catholic Biblical Association. Uh, we have Javier Ruiz Ortiz, lecturer in Hebrew Bible and Old Testament at St. Mary's University, whose most recent monograph was on violence in the Book of Esther. Uh, Victor Darlington, lecturer in Sacred Scripture at St. John's Seminary, Wanersh, and a specialist on the Gospel of John. And Adrian Graffley, who is wearing two hats today. As well as being a member of the CBA, Adrian is also a member of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, representing England and Wales, and is a co-translator of the English version of What is Man, published by Darton, Longman and Todd. So on behalf of the committee, it's a great privilege to welcome our prestigious speaker, Professor Nuria Kalduk Banajes. Professor Kalduk Banajes, who originates from Barcelona in Catalonia, is Professor of Old Testament at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where she has lectured in the theology faculty since 1991, <clears throat> and from where she joins us this morning. Nuria's CV includes a dazzling array prestigious academic responsibilities and memberships, which has included being elected vice president of the International Society for the Study of Deuterocanonical Literature in 2013, as well as membership of a range of academic and editorial boards. Professor Kalduk Banajas's research focuses on the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible and the deuterocanonical books, with a particular specialism in Ben Sira. Nuria has published more than 15 books or edited volumes, innumerable journal articles, and has supervised 25 doctoral theses. The full list of Nuria's academic contributions runs to more than 28 pages, so I will just mention the titles of a few notable volumes to offer a flavour of the breadth of her research expertise. Uh, so a number of publications in recent years include Treasures of Wisdom, Studies on Ben Syrah and the Book of Wisdom, uh, Wisdom for Life, published by de Gruyter in 2014, and On Wings of Prayer, Sources of Jewish Worship, again by de Gruyter in 2019. Professor Kalduk Banajas' most recent publication is an edited collection of 24 of her articles on Ben Syrah, which will be published by de Gruyter in 2021, entitled For Wisdom's Sake, Collected Essays on the Book of Ben Syrah. Professor Kalduk Banajas has been a respected committee member of the Pontifical Biblical Commission since 2014, and 10 days ago, on the 9th of March 2021, Nuria was appointed Secretary of the Pontifical Biblical Commission by Pope Francis, the first woman to be appointed to this highly prestigious office. So on behalf of the Catholic Biblical Association of Great Britain, I'd like to warmly congratulate you on this appointment. We are privileged that Professor Kalduk Banajas has agreed to introduce us to the latest Pontifical Biblical Commission document this morning, entitled What is Man? A Study of Biblical Anthropology, published in English by Darton, Longman and Torres next week. Nuria will share with us some of the insights that this document opens up on what it means to be a human being, enriched especially by the depths of the wisdom literature, particularly the Song of Songs. We could not be in more accomplished hands. So I now welcome Professor Kalduk Vinajas with thanks to begin today's presentation. So, good morning and perhaps good afternoon or good evening in some parts uh, of the world, yeah, to all of you. And uh, I really, I am very honored <laughs> to be here in front of you. And I want to thank all the team that has uh, prepared this uh, event yeah, with uh, so much care and so much attention. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now, 
I will present uh, this uh, document and I will do it um, in uh, two distinct parts, I would say, or perhaps three, yeah? First, a uh, brief historical overview of the commission, then uh, exactly uh, the structure, yeah, the articulation of the document in general, and then an example, yeah, an example of one specific topic. Yeah? And then if everything functions well, I'm going to share the screen in order that you have the possibility of following what I'm going to say with uh, some slides. I hope that this is uh, visible, that everything is okay. Huh? This is the title, yeah, very simple. <laughs> it's the title of the document, as you see. Eh? What is man? A journey through biblical anthropology. So before presenting the last document of the Biblical Commission, perhaps it would be helpful to say a few words about the commission itself especially for those who do not know it or have little information about it. Um, it was created uh, by Pope Leo XIII in 1902. At that time, its members were all cardinals, assisted by consultors who were assigned a threefold task, as you see in the slide to promote biblical study effectively among Catholics, to counteract erroneous opinions on sacred scripture by scientific means, and to study and illuminate debated questions and emerging problems in the biblical field. Two years later, in 1904, Pope Pius X granted to the Biblical Commission the faculty of conferring the academic degrees of licensiate and doctorate in biblical studies. It was the time of the modernist crisis in the Catholic Church, the most acute phase of Christianity's confrontation with the modern age, a time that was not very propitious for the historical study of the Bible. The Pontifical Biblical Commission intervened, for example, in the question of the author of the book of Isaiah with a series of five replies in 1908 that we can still read in the Densinger or in the Inquiridion Biblical. According to the commission, the thesis, the thesis of a plurality of authors, all of you remember the first, the second and the third Isaiah, proposed by the Protestant scholar Berhard Duhm in his influential commentary on Isaiah that appeared in 1892 was not acceptable. His arguments were deemed insufficient to depart from the traditional thesis of a single author for the whole book. Remember that we were in the 90s. Yeah? The years following the creation of the commission were a difficult period for Catholic biblical scholars, such as Father Marie Joseph Lagrange, the Dominican from the L'Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem, who wanted to take an interest in historical studies of the Old and New Testament. And most of us, we know the story that he was even persecuted uh, because of, of his new ideas eh, about the Bible. At that time, this historical critical approach to scripture had already been developed by Protestant scholars, yeah? not in the uh, in Catholic ambience, but in the Protestant world, as was very well known yeah? and, and, and used. Several decades later, in 1971, as part of the great post-conciliar reform, the Pope uh, Paul VI established 
new norms for the organization and functioning of the Biblical Commission in order to make its work more fruitful for the church and better adapted to the contemporary situation. These new rules marked a radical change for the role and organization of the commission. From then on, the members were no longer cardinals assisted by consultants, but 20 biblical scholars, all ecclesiastics with a few rare exceptions, coming from various schools and nations who meet every year in the second week after Easter to discuss a specific biblical topic. The new Biblical Commission thus became a consultative body placed at the service of the Magisterium and linked to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the prefect of which is also the president of the Commission. I would like now, uh, let me see exactly, to uh, have a look at this commission, yeah, here in one of the pictures that we took uh, last year, uh, last two years, yeah. Uh, here you see the Pope, evident, and here is Cardinal Ladaria, uh, the Jesuit, uh, Luis Ladaria, who is the uh, our president, yeah. Here our secretary, uh, Father um, Pietro Bovati, and well, we are here. All of us also with the translations, the translators, and also the, um, the secretary, the technical secretary, uh, Don uh, Bellano. Yeah? I would like to point out, I was saying, that since I was appointed in 2014, there have been three women biblical scholars among the members of the commission. You see here uh, the American Mary Healy, Dr. Mary Healy, Dr. Bruna Costacurta from Italy and myself. And uh, she is the one here in the on my right, is um, one of our translators, yeah, an excellent translator. Yeah. So, yeah, I have said, well, I have shown you this picture, but in 2021, this year, two more women have been appointed. And in total, now we are five out of 20. And now I pass you some pictures in order not to make you tired, yeah. Here are some beautiful pictures uh, that I got from the Pope, and you see that to be in the in the commission, well, you also have some privileges, yeah. <laughs> we were, I was giving him some books, yeah, and laughing because he is very, I mean, really, he, he is unique, yeah. <laughs> he likes to to make jokes, etc., uh, etc. Et so, it's enough of pictures, yeah. In addition to the document that we will present shortly, the new commission has published eight documents. And here are the titles of the most recent ones, not all, eh? only the five, the five last ones. The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church in 1993. It was very important because uh, it uh, took into consideration all the new uh, methodologies and approaches, yeah, exegetical approaches. The Jewish people and their sacred scriptures in the Christian Bible, 2001. The Bible and morality, 2008. The inspiration and truth of sacred scripture, 2014. And our document, What is Man? A Journey Through Biblical Anthropology, 2019. Let's now pass uh, to a presentation of our document. What is man? Here you have in first uh, position the English uh, version. And this side you can see the Italian one, che cosa è l'uomo, uh, qu'est-ce que c'est l'homme in, in French, and then also in Spanish, eh, que, que es el hombre. And there are other translations that are in course, and, and also in Korean, you, you can have the Korean version uh, in the website of the Vatican. There are uh, many members that are still working on the translations. This document is the fruit of the Commission's work over the period 2014-2019. to 
And in this presentation, I will faithfully follow the wise advice of Father Luis Alonso Shekel to both students and teachers. He always said, you will produce fruit by the sweat of your brow, but please give me the fruit, not the sweat. And I am going to follow his advice. Yeah? I am only going to present you the fruits. The first part of the title, What is Man?, is a very old and at the same time very topical question. It is the question posed by the psalmist and which we men and women of the 21st century continue to ask ourselves, a question that no one can or should evade. The subtitle of the document, A Journey Through Biblical Anthropology, indicates the method adopted in the Commission's attempt to answer the fundamental question. The document is not a manual, nor an introduction, nor a compendium of biblical anthropology, but a journey. That is a biblical and anthropological journey. In other words, as the document says, number four, it is a synthesis of what the Bible says about anthropology. The secretary of the commission, Jesuit Pietro Bovati, pointed out an interesting aspect of the methodology. I quote, in obedience to the word of God, which demands to be considered in its totality, the document does not take quotations or isolated text, claiming them as scriptural proof of a pre-established discourse, but assumes the task of exposing the entire communicative path of the Bible. Pope Francis, taking into account the pastoral challenges of our time, asked the member of the commission to study the conception of the human being in sacred scripture in order to offer not only the Christians, but the whole world a reassuring message from the interpretation of the biblical texts. Following the Pope's mandate, the Biblical Commission does not limit itself in this document to answering a few specific anthropological questions, but offers an integral vision of the human being, of his and her dignity, of his or her relationships, and of his or her destiny. So that in this global framework, the challenges of our culture find their rightful place. Let's now have a look at the structure of the document. Yeah? The presentation by Cardinal Luis Ladaria, the current president of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, is followed by a brief introduction in which some fundamental hermeneutical principles that are at the basis of the document are presented obedience to the word of God, the totality of scripture, human beings in relationships, human beings in history. And this is followed by some practical suggestions for further reading. And finally, a mention of the spirit in which the document is offered. You find this in the first 13 numbers. The document has almost 400 pages is more than the document, eh? is, is practically, it's, it's a book, yeah? it's a book, is divided into four chapters, followed by a brief conclusion. The first chapter, the human being created by God, presents the human being, male and female, as God's creature. If, on the one hand, man is made of dust, on the other, he is a living being, thanks to to the divine breath. The second chapter, the human being in the garden, illustrates the condition of the human being in the paradise of Eden. Here, the themes of nourishment, uh, work, uh, and the relationship with other living beings are addressed. And the third chapter, the human family, the largest one, deals with the interpersonal relationships that arise within the family and then extend into social life. The relationships 
between spouses, between parents and children, between brothers and sisters, as well as some problematic issues relating to sexuality or conflicts between peoples. The fourth chapter, The Human Being in History, is dedicated to the human relationship with the law. Sinners transgress the divine command by choosing the path of death. But God's intervention transforms human history into the story of salvation. This is in synthesis and the message of this chapter. A novelty of the document is its method of exposition. It's really original. Since the Genesis 2-3 account that has to be read together with Genesis 1, of course, is the programmatic basis of the document, at the beginning of each chapter, after a brief introduction, you find a passage from the foundational narrative that is reproduced in bold type, yeah, to make the reading easier. In the third chapter, you have Genesis 2, 4, 7. In the second chapter, Genesis 2, 8, 20. In the third chapter, Genesis 2, 21, 25. And in the fourth chapter, we have three main passages. Genesis 2, 16, 17, 3, 1, 7, and 3, 8, 24. Let's go on. The biblical text is followed by a brief exegetical comment in italics, yeah? italics, <laughs> italics, yeah, which aims to highlight the thematic motifs that are to be developed. The individual themes are then treated systematically, following the material available in the various constitutive parts of scripture. So, for the Old Testament, we follow the traditional tripartite division, the Torah, Pentateuch, Prophets, and Wisdom Writings, paying particular attention to the Psalter. And for the New Testament, we have chosen a simple two-part division. On the one hand, the Gospels, taking account of the example and teaching of Jesus, the teacher, highlighting especially their innovative aspects. How, this is how the document says. And on the other hand, the tradition of the apostles, especially the Pauline writings. This order is not followed slavishly in each section, uh, but is adapted to the themes under consideration in each treatment. Additional developments of various kinds will often be inserted in the text in a smaller font yeah, to distinguish uh, them from the others, to help the reader who wishes to explore the topic further. Some of them are terminological clarifications, such as the expression, for instance, image of God. What does it mean? Yeah? Or the term Adam in Hebrew. Yeah? What is the meaning of, uh, of this term? While others are small digressions on subjects such as angels, genealogies, the right of circumcision, the devil, the laws of war, and the liberate tradition. Still others are short considerations that help to understand better the biblical passages about human nourishment, the care of creation, forgiveness, and the new covenant, and many similar topics. Let us now glance at the outline of the first chapter to illustrate how the findings of the commission are presented in this document. So we have chapter one, the title, the human being created by God, and then uh, the elements, a brief introduction, numbers 14, 15, then the biblical text eh, on bold type, Genesis 2, 4, 7, then the exegetical comment in italics, 16, 18, and in this case, an additional development that has to deal with terminology, some questions of terminology. This is in synthesis, eh, the first uh, 
the presentation of the first chapter. And then we go to the themes, eh, the topics of this chapter. Theme one, the human being made of earth. And here we have a small introduction. And you see now we follow hmm, this uh, canonical, we can say like that, no? uh, order. But with some changes, in this time we begin with wisdom writings after the Torah, Pentateuch, after the Psalter, the Prophets, Gospels, and Paul. Yeah? Because this order fits uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, specific, uh, specific topic. And if we have a look at the second topic, the divine breath in the human being, we have a very similar yeah, uh, structure, a small introduction. Here we have some specific uh, numbers, uh, 46, 53, yeah, that are some kind general. Yeah? The human being in the image of the living God. And then again, we follow the Bible the Torah, the human being like God in the practice of justice, wisdom writings, wisdom, bringer of life and of authority, the prophets, the man of God, Psalter, meditation on the human being crowned with glory and honor, the gospel, Jesus of Nazareth, true man, image of God, and Paul, the Christian image of God. And of course, a small brief uh, conclusion. So we, I have uh, presented only chapter one, yeah, with these two topics, but this is more or less what you will find in the rest of the chapters. Yeah? That's why I am not going to continue this uh, presentation uh, because this could be, it's, it's, not, it's not useful. But what I am going to do now is to focus in one aspect. Yeah? And I have chosen this one, I hope that you will like it. Human love, yeah? human love in the Bible, in the light of the document, yeah? So these numbers, if you want to read, 158 until 164. As with so many aspects of human life, we do not find in scripture a systematic treatment of the relationship between man and woman. However, the theme is present from beginning to end of the Bible, both in its concrete expressions of the marriage union and in its symbolic use as an image capable of expressing spiritual and transcendent covenants. These are the words of the document. Among all the books of the Bible, however, there is one that deserves special attention, precisely because it is offered to us as an exemplary poem on human love. This is the Song of Songs, so called because it is the greatest of songs, since it is the song of love of every man and of every woman who live to love one another and in Two voices declare their affection and their happiness. The inspiring motif of the Song of Songs is precisely human love in all its range of feelings and passions. It is experienced by two young lovers against the background of a nature filled with fragrances, colors, and flavors. The couple express their love in searching for each other, giving and receiving kisses and caresses, and whispering tenderly how they long for physical union. Human love knows the suffering of separation and the joy of rediscovery. The dialogue between the lovers, in which the reader also participates in the figure of the chorus, disappears only at the end of the poem to make way for a kind of commentary on love, the only one in the book, which sublimely expresses the indissolubility of the lover's union. We read in the Song of Song, chapter eight, for love is strong as death, jealousy as fierce as Sheol. Its flame is a flame of fire, a mighty flame. 
the Song of Songs should be interpreted with all the beauty, mystery, and eroticism that this universal human experience contains. In the words of Father Alonso Shekel, the Song of Songs, I quote, is a song of love with something of the original heavenly innocence and much of an ideal definitive dream, end of quote. Among the many aspects of this love song that could be explored, the document concentrates on five, starting with the experience of beauty. If beauty is, as it is usually defined, that quality which satisfies the soul through the senses, becoming an object of deserved and worthy contemplation, then we can say that beauty is woven into every page of the Song of Songs, which describes a quality of the human body admired in its splendor, without shame, but above all appreciated because it makes one fall in love, because it is a body that arouses love insofar as it speaks of love. These are the words of the document. Let us go to the text, to the original text. His eyes, full of wonder, the lover praises the beauty of his beloved and says, how beautiful you are, my love, how beautiful you are. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats frisking down Mount Gilead. Your teeth, a flock of shorn sheep coming up from the washing. Each one has its twin, not one unpaired with another. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your words enchanting. Your cheeks behind your veil are halves of pomegranate. Your neck is the Tower of David, built in layers, hung round with a thousand bucklers, and each the shield of a hero. Your breasts are two fawns, twins of a gazelle, that feed among the lilies. Before the day breeze rises, before the shadows flee, I shall go to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. How beautiful you are, my love. There is no blemish in you. Now, the woman feels the same astonishment when contemplating the splendor of her beloved. She celebrates the color, sweetness, beauty, and strength of the man's body from head to toe. And seduced by his virile charm, the bride exclaims, my love <clears throat> is fresh and ready to be known among 10,000. His head is golden, purest gold. His locks are palm fronds and black as the raven. His eyes are like doves beside the watercourses bath with milk perched on a fountain rim. His checks are bits of spices, banks sweetly scented. His lips are lilies, distilling pure mirror. His hands are golden, rounded, set with jewels of Tarshish. His belly a block of ivory, covered with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set in sockets of pure gold. His appearance is that of Lebanon, unrivaled as the cedars. His speech is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovable. Such is my love. Such is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. The mutual contemplation of the lover's bodies opens our senses to the profound theological and spiritual dimension of human love since in their bodies the spirit is revealed. Authentic human love is not reduced to pure physicality, but is deeply spiritual and therefore open to transcendence. 
as Gianni Barbiero writes in the preface to his commentary. I quote, the love of the song of the songs is open to transcendence on all sides and cannot be understood without it. In the poem, the love shared by the couple corresponds to the logic of incarnation. It is at once body and soul, sensual and spiritual, earthly and transcendent, most human and divine." End of the quote. I hope that reading the Song of Songs will help us not to be afraid of our bodies and their beauty, because in biblical anthropology, the body is the person, him or herself, seen in his or her relationship with the other. In philosophical terms, if you want, every encounter I have with another person is possible thanks to the body I am. It is thanks to my body that I can make myself visible to the other, and the other can make him or herself visible to me. It is thanks to my body that I can come into contact with the things that surround me. The French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty writes, the body is enigmatic. It is part of the world, no doubt, but strangely offered as its own habitat to an absolute desire to approach the other and to reach him or her, even in his, her or her, his or her body, animated and animating a natural figure of the spirit." End of the quote. So let's now, after beauty, pass to the second aspect, mutual searching and the desire for communion. As in love poetry of all times, the motif of mutual searching is very frequent in the Song of Songs. Love is expressed as a search for the beloved, who is called the love of my soul. When they are not together, lovers are anxious to see each other, to meet, to embrace. They anxiously seek one each other, yearning for reunion. To express this desire, the poet uses two Hebrew verbs, bakash, that means to seek, in the sense of desiring, and matzah, that means to find. Seeking expresses not only the absence of an object, or in our case of a person, but also the perception of this absence as a lack, as something that should be there and is not. This is a fundamental experience of the human being who is constitutionally a being in search of something or someone. Diane Bergant says that the next passage that we will now read from the song expresses the woman's healthy passion, the profound tenacity of her search for the man she loves, her indomitable courage in overcoming all possible obstacles and her confident commitment to building the environment of the couple's encounter. Here is the voice of the beloved. On my bed at night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought but could not find him. So I shall get up and go around the city, in the streets and in the squares. I shall seek him whom my soul loves. I sought, but I could not find him. I came upon the watchmen, those who go around the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Barely had I passed then, when I found him whom my soul loves. I caught him, could not let him go, not till I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room where she conceived me. Look at the text, yeah? This uh, um, insistence yeah, on the verb to seek, yeah? this verb that has strong, strong power in itself. Yeah? I sought him, I sought, yeah? I shall seek, yeah? I sought again. Yeah? The mutual searching finally blossoms in the passionate encounter. 
the lover comes, in fact, in the night of desire, knocking on the door of his lover. He enters the secret room where life originates, so that love is realized in the intimacy of mutual belonging. These are the words of the document again. Yeah? Let us pass now to another very interesting aspect that is called a unique relationship. The Song of Song has a myriad of images, both from the natural world and from human life. Mountains, hills, valleys, gardens, fountains, trees, flowers, fruits, animals, towers, houses, doors, and windows. The images invite us to awaken our own powers of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling the good things of the earth. Above all, the scene is occupied by the two lovers, whose names we don't know. We don't know who they are. We meet them as a man and a woman who are totally given to each other. There is no room for anybody else. My love is mine and I am his. In a recent study, Ludger Schwinghorst Schoenberger, professor at the University of Vienna, reviews the different biblical traditions on the figure of Solomon, particularly in the Song of Songs, the Book of Kohelet and various other traditions. But with regard to the Song of Songs, he dwells on two rather enigmatic verses, which we're going to read now. Yeah? Perhaps the most difficult ones. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He entrusted it to overseers, and each was to pay him the value of its produce, 1,000 shekels of silver but I tend my own vineyard myself. You, Solomon, may have your thousand shekels, and those who tend its produce their two hundred. In this small passage, the poet plays on the ambivalence of metaphors with the aim of creating a sharp contrast between Solomon, presented in a negative light, and the beloved of the Song of Songs, who excels in his role as bridegroom. Solomon's vineyard consists of his thousand women, the royal harem, which according to 1 Kings 11.3, was composed of 700 princesses and 300 concubines. Quite a few. Eh? By contrast, the vineyard of the beloved of the song is his bride alone. My dove is my only one, perfect and mine. Although difficult to interpret, these two verses say something essential about love. Love is understood as a personal relationship between two persons, which in its uniqueness cannot be replaced by anything else. It avoids being placed at the level of exchange, consuming or comparison. Here is how the document describes this unique relationship between the two lovers. It's number uh, 161. Of the bride, the beloved, beloved says, my dove is my only one. She alone can satisfy with beauty and love the desire of her spouse. There are countless girls, but only one is chosen, the most beautiful, the favorite, as a lily among thistles, as splendid as the sun, the star of which on its own lights up the world. She is the exclusive possession of the beloved. She is a garden enclosed, my sister, my bride, 
a garden enclosed, a sealed fountain. Similarly, the beloved is among young men, as an apple tree among the trees of the wood. He has something more than any other. He is known among 10,000, and for him, therefore, the exquisite fruits of love are stored up. So, we pass now to, I think, the fourth, yeah, the fourth aspect, a fragile love to be protected. Love, like the other vital passions, is an event of the human heart. In the Bible, as in many languages, the word heart, in Hebrew we say lev or lebab, not only designates the anatomical organ, but has a very broad meaning related to numerous psychic and spiritual experiences pertaining to the inner self. The heart embraces the affective, conscious, intelligent, and free personality of the human being as a whole. In other words, it constitutes the most intimate reality of the human being the collection and sorting center of the person's intimate life. The heart is therefore the center of Semitic psychology. For the Semite, the heart is the principle of all the affections and activities of the soul. Feelings, intelligence and will dwell in the most important and mysterious organ of life. Nevertheless, there is the other side also, no? The heart also goes through experiences of darkness, of uncertainty, of restlessness, and of disappointment. In other words, there is a fragility in the heart that is necess a necessary condition for full experiencing love. The beloved of the Song of Songs searches in vain for the love of her soul. She seeks it everywhere without ceasing. She cannot bear separation any longer. Her heart aches. And finally, her beloved knocks on her room, but when she opens the door, he is no longer there. I sought but could not find him. I called to him, but he did not answer. She is in shock. The opportunity that she longed for with all heart had vanished into thin air. In a fleeting moment, the joy of welcoming her lover turns into the grief of absence, loss, and disappointment. Lovers must run the risk of becoming vulnerable. If they are to be sincere and forthright in manifesting the nature and depth of their love for each other. But emotions can be misinterpreted, intentions can be misunderstood, and the vulnerability of lovers can make them too sensitive. The heart is fragile, and as such must always be guarded. Threats also come from outside, as in the case of the little foxes that we have here in the slide, that are ready, ready. Yeah? These little foxes that ravage the vineyard in any moment. Therefore, when the lovers experience vulnerability, weakness, loss, or fear, they must remember that striving for invulnerability, domination, enslavement, or control will destroy love. They must wait for consummation of their heart's desires. They cannot command that the other surrender to them. Set me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy as fierce as Sheol. Its flame is a flame of fire, a mighty flame. We have also read it before. And now we reach the last aspect, yeah? The feast, yeah? the feast. 
there is a festive atmosphere in the song because the groom and bride convey their own happiness to others. We have just mentioned the kinds of things that can ruin love, but we want to conclude our presentation by talking about joy, celebration, happiness, and song. Let us meditate for a moment on the positive side of love and especially its communal celebration. And here we have the three protagonists yeah, uh, involved in a kind of conversation, in a dialogue, the bride, the groom, and the chorus. The bride. Awake, north wind, come, wind of the south. Breathe over my gut to spread its sweet smell around. Let my love come into his garden. Let him taste its most exquisite fruits. And then the groom answers. I come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I pick my myrrh and balsam. I taste my honey and my honeycomb. I drink my wine and my milk. And then the chorus. Eat, friends. Eat and drink. Drink deep with love making. This dialogue expresses an unparalleled sense of well-being, exuberance, and euphoria. The images of eating and drinking symbolize the delights of the lover's bodily union. And the last voice, perhaps that of the chorus, or even the poet, here experts, I mean, uh, have different opinions, invites everyone to feast on love as the couple do, and not in moderation, yeah, but in abundance. And this is an indication of how much human sexuality is appreciated. It is described not only as a natural fact, but as a splendid reality. It should be noted that the two lovers are not warned against the excessive powers that sexuality can contain within itself. On the contrary, it is precisely these powers that are celebrated. For the author of the Song of Songs, enjoying love and its joys is thus an act of faith in life, despite the menace of death. So, by way of conclusion, we try to conclude our presentation. I begin with uh, these uh, words uh, taken from the document number 158. He and she, the two lovers, are closely united with each other while conserving their own individual identity. Indeed, exalting it as something desired and attractive for the other. The relationship is born of a mutually appreciated beauty develops as a continuous searching and reciprocal knowledge and is fulfilled in a longed for communion. This is how love is revealed, the love that is capable of generating people's happiness and of transforming everything in the world into a celebration that brings the light to all. The feeling of love is too profound and to be defined, described studied or calculated, escaping all schemes, elusive and incomprehensible. It is situated in the realm of the gratuitous, the paradoxal, the marvelous, the divine. Apparently opposing dimensions coexist in the couple's love in the Song of Songs, reciprocity and distance, belonging and detachment, giving and fear, Enjoying, enjoyment and suffering, word and silence, life and death, all at once. The human love celebrated in the Song of Songs is a love open to transcendence, a love that touches the threshold of the divine, a life force as strong as death. Ultimately, a reflection of the passionate love that God has for humanity. I will 
finish with this beautiful uh, picture of Marc Chagall uh, that we all know and his uh, artistic commentary. Yeah, it's a commentary, a visual commentary of the Song of Songs. So I have limited uh, my presentation to the Song of Songs, but we should remember that in the Pentateuch, this poem was read as a great allegory of the love between Israel, the bride loved by the Lord, and God, the spouse who is love itself. The prophetic traditions will use the same symbolic device of espousal love to illustrate the story of God's attachment to his people, is what we call mm -hmm. the espousal metaphor, yeah? the marriage metaphor, or we can call it in many ways. The New Testament will echo this in various ways, narrating, among other things, at the conclusion of the Gospels, the encounter in the garden between the risen Lord and Mary of Magdala. Yeah? So at this point, it only remains for me to strongly recommend reading this document, not only to all of you, but also to professors and students of other theological faculties, institutes of religious sciences, catechists, and anyone interested in biblical anthropology. Thank you very much for your patience and for your attention. Yeah. And I excuse, I apologize for the English that sometimes I imagine that has not been very sharp, but I I did my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Nuria, for that one really wonderful presentation, uh, taking us through the structure of the document, uh, but most of all for sharing the fruit, sharing the fruit uh, rather than just the sweat, as you were saying earlier, sharing the fruit of uh, the kind of layers of meaning of human love uh, in the Song of Songs um, that opens out onto transcendence. And as you say, it's picked up and reinterpreted then within the other books uh, of the Bible both the Old and the New Testament. So thank you so much, really, really wonderful uh, presentation uh, and so much for us to reflect upon there in the kind of layers of meaning uh, of love and human sexuality there in that presentation. So if we just take now a five minute break, uh, a five minute break to let, <laughs> to let us uh, uh, reflect on our thoughts to, to kind of put the kettle on for a cup of tea. Uh, so it's three minutes to 12 now. If we come back about two or three minutes after 12, uh, just allow us five minutes or so. Uh, we'll then have about 20 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, I know some people have already emailed in questions. If you haven't and you would like to, the email address um, will be on the uh, holding screen. Uh, it's catholicbiblicalassociation.gb at gmail.com, uh, but it will be on the holding screen as well. So it's all one word, catholicbiblicalassociation.gb at gmail.com, and we'll try and ask some of your uh, questions to Nuria. Uh, but thank you so much, Nuria, for a really wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll just take a, a five minute break now and then we'll be back to rejoin you uh, all then and, and to respond to some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're all very, very welcome back. Uh, so we've now got a period of about 20 minutes or so uh, where we can uh, have some discussion and, and questions with, with Nuria. So thank you once again, Nuria, for a really wonderful uh, presentation, taking us through the document, explaining the structure. Uh, in the different chapters, uh, and also for that beautiful presentation on the Song of Songs uh, and that description of human love and those kind of layers of meaning. Uh, so one of the questions I thought I'd begin by asking you that's come in uh, from one of our viewers uh, relates to what you were touching on at the end of, of the presentation and, and how this image of human love between a man and a woman in the Song of Songs uh, then gets picked up and uh, understood, reinterpreted, uh, in the Bible itself as that kind of allegorical uh, relationship of God, uh, God and Israel, that, that motif you were talking about, how human love opens out onto transcendence and describes the relationship, not just between men and women, uh, but also between human beings and God as well. I am, yeah. So, yeah, this, uh, this last... Uh, part is quite interesting. Of course, I, I could not uh, speak about the whole process, yeah? 
because the process is this that I, the one that I, ha I have indicated, yeah, the song of songs, but uh, the song of songs uh, is um, linked, yeah, to the spousal metaphor, yeah, used in the prophets, but also used in wisdom literature, also used in New Testament, the Gospels, also used by Paul, in his letters, yeah, applied to the church in a different yeah. way, and also used in some uh, mm, pseudopigraphical works, yeah, mm -hmm. also, also. It's, uh, I would say that mm, for us, the main, mm, the main um, prophet uh, to, I mean, to, to quote is the prophet Hosea, yeah, because uh, he was, uh, the one, the first one uh, to use this spousal metaphor, yeah, to express mm -hmm. the relation, uh, the marital relation between uh, God and Israel. Yeah? God becomes uh, the husband, and Israel becomes the wife, with a certainly a problem because uh, the husband is always faithful, yeah, and the wife mm -hmm. is the one who. Uh, I mean, <laughs> chooses another way <laughs> with the lovers and etc. Mm. etc. Of course, this is an image, yeah. This is a, a symbol, this is a literary way, yeah, of expressing this strong, strong, strong and intimate relationship that uh, Adonai, the God of Israel, had with uh, its people, yeah. What I find it very much interesting and um, is that this same image, this same metaphor, yeah, has been used by wisdom tradition, and and I say that in order that you see also this this progress, yeah, uh, in wisdom tradition by the sages of Israel, but uh, in wisdom literature this image um, is treated differently. You don't find God as the husband and Israel as the as the unfaithful. Uh, wife the protagonist change a little bit mm -hmm. and then you find the disciple is the, the 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 man yeah and then you find wisdom let me call it lady wisdom that is the female uh, character yeah so there is a very important uh, change yeah of is a, is a different parameter yeah? uh, we can yeah. say that but the love story yeah is the same yeah? is the disciple that uh, desires yeah to find to meet wisdom to be with her yeah uh, to have uh, her etc etc yeah and then lady wisdom uh, it is the woman no, that she's searched for that she's loved uh, and and that it changes because lady wisdom is the one who teaches uh, the the disciple yeah but but within this tradition I am speaking of Proverbs, I am speaking of Ben Saira. Mm -hmm. But if we reach the wisdom of Solomon, then there is an important change to be noted. Because in the wisdom of Solomon, these two protagonists uh, become three. There is a triangle. We have the disciple, of course, always. We have wisdom, but we have God also. Because in the yeah. wisdom of yeah. Solomon, yes, we almost we always um, speak about uh, um, Solomon, you know, the pseudo Solomon that falls in love with wisdom. But at the same time, this wisdom, yeah, uh, is extremely united with God. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a triangle of love, yeah, in 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 the last this last book, wisdom of Solomon. I, I want to say, yeah, that this is an image, this is a, a, a symbol, this is an instrument, yeah, that uh, the authors, yeah, the prophets, the sages, also the New Testament uh, uh, narrators that have used, yeah, to express this mystery, this yeah. mystery, yeah, this yeah. God that falls in love uh, with humanity, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Nero, that's really wonderful, I think that as you said, you're kind of talking about the way those metaphors are kind of used and developed in, in other books within scripture as well. So thank you, that's lovely. Uh, another question and on a more kind of practical uh, level, um, you mentioned again towards the end about how this is a book, uh, quite a lengthy book, about 350 pages, um, that um, 
can be used by all sorts of people in terms of you know, kind of theological students, uh, lay people, catechists. And so I wonder in particular, there was one person saying, as a catechist, would you have kind of recommendations as to how they might approach uh, maybe using a part of the, of the book in a certain way, particularly for, for kind of uh, younger students, for sort of teenagers, if they were trying to um, get, encourage them to read the Bible and reflect on uh, theology. Are there ways in which you might encourage them perhaps to use part of the, the book in that way? Yeah, I have said that this is, this is not a document because if you uh, if you look at the other, the previous documents, they are as near, like booklets, yeah? Uh, <laughs> yeah. They are smaller in format, and you know, they are short, yeah, is an, another kind, yeah. But our is really is is ours is, is a book, yeah. So, uh, and perhaps, uh, well, this is a this is an advantage for some, but perhaps a disadvantage disadvantage for others, yeah, because it's too long, yeah. It's too long. <laughs> so, I would not advise to to read the book. I mean, like uh, Romans, but from the beginning to the end. This no because then it's too much, because mm. it's a concentration yeah, of topics, yeah, uh, and this mm, is not, uh, it's not pedagogical to do like yeah. that. I would yeah. choose yeah? Yeah. And, to, and to focus, uh, for instance, in one aspect of one topic, yeah? not even one topic, one aspect. Yeah? Yeah. Perhaps, um, as I have done today, I have chosen only human love five aspects, five, five points. And I have, I mean, only treated these, yeah? And then with these, you have all the links to other texts of the scripture. And this is enough, it's more, more than enough, yeah? Then you can say, I am interested in the question of food. Mm -hmm. Food, okay. Then I go and I choose only uh, the main passage and then the main points, yeah? And from, from this, I go on. Because otherwise, um, if you want to use it for uh, young people or for or for children also, yeah, yeah. Um, in a very pastoral in a pastoral way, uh, is full of is is full of uh, of uh, quotations. Uh, is full of is a very has a density. Yeah, uh, full of explanations. Also Hebrew words. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the book is very complete, yeah, and so it would be too much. I think that you have to pick uh, what really you yeah. you want. This would be my yeah. advice, yeah. I also do that in my in the university. Yeah, yeah. I recommend to read the book, but when I uh, prepare the lessons, I choose yeah. the numbers, and then I say I recommend you to read this, yeah, and then if they read the whole book, better. But uh, to focus is always is always good. Yeah. No, thank you. I think, that, I think that's really, really good advice. As you said, because with your presentation today, it comes across so well, where you focus on one aspect in detail, and already you can see the, the kind of richness that's there to reflect upon. Um, yeah, really, thank you very much. That's very I good think. advice. Thank you. And um, so the next question we've got, I wonder if I can ask uh, Adrian first, because it's partly to do with the, the translation, uh, and it's to do uh, with this issue of kind of gender language. So, Nuria, you may want to come in later as well, because as you mentioned earlier, translations into all sorts of uh, languages as well from the original Italian. Uh, so I've got a question here, Adrian. Um, how has the PBC document, What is Man, sought to be sensitive to the gendered nature of language, and especially to inclusive language, in this English translation of the document? Um, and they put it, or to put the question more simply, does this translation use the word man uh, constantly to mean human being, as the title, What is Man, uh, taken from Psalm 8, might suggest. So I just wondered if you could tell people a little bit about the English translation. As I mentioned at the beginning, you were one of the co-translators uh, of the English version. Yes, that's a very, a very kind way of putting the question. <laughs> I know that there are some people who say, well, why are they using man at all? What is man? Um, of course, we discussed this. We had lots of arguments about this, and there were those who said, don't use this quotation as the title of the book because it has this issue of, of man. Um, you can say we could have translated the title as what is the human being, or, what is human, something like that. But 
uh, well, in the end, the idea prevailed that this is a traditional translation of Psalm 8. You've got it in the other, in the other uh, languages. So we felt we had to maintain it. But as you've, as you pointed out, it's not really, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> so once you go inside, and this was very clear from Nuria's slides, it's all the human being this, the human being that. So um, I'm sure in the other languages, but I can speak for English that uh, Fergus and I, we were absolutely determined to have respectful language for, ev for, for everybody, that people would not be offended by this language. And so we are mortified that some, some may be, and, and we hope that um, that won't stop you from getting inside the book because it is so, and as, as Nuria has pointed out, there is so much richness. There are so many things you can just alight on and, and, and discover and say, oh, I'd forgotten how good the Bible was, you know? So people can rediscover various aspects uh, simply by dipping into this book, which as we've said is very long. And we hope it's quite apart from the issue of man and human beings that it's, it's easy to understand or easy enough to understand, so. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. And just, just to follow up again, in terms of the, the biblical translation used as well, I think it links with our the last of the talks we had with Henry Wandsworth yeah. as well. Revised, uh, and if you wanted to say a little bit about the, the yeah, biblical translation. Revised, that revised New Jerusalem Bible, because we wanted a, a modern uh, translation, one that's also uh, uh, uses inclusive language. And it was just out uh, the time we started working on the translation last year. So it, it, there was no contest. That was the translation to use. OK, thank you, Agents. So I hope uh, people find that reassuring for, for questions about the language. I don't know, Nuri, as well, uh, you've mentioned in terms of the other uh, translations. So similarly, in, in Spanish and Italian, uh, well, Italian was the original uh, version, uh, French, as you've mentioned, that, that again, there's this similar emphasis to try and be inclusive as possible in, in the language. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel in the same uh, situation uh, as Adrian. I mean, also in the Spanish version that, that I, I have coordinated, I had the same problem, I must mm. say the truth. No? Uh, personally, I immediately saw that the title was not adequate Yeah, in this very moment. I would have preferred to use ser humano yeah? in Spanish, this is human being yeah? for you. But, uh, you know, uh, there are many opinions you know, and, and different positions. Also, I speak about the publishing houses and, mm. and other people, yeah. And I tried, I tried, I tried hard <laughs> yeah. to convince them that it would be better, yeah, to use even in the title, yeah. Uh, why not? I mean, I, I, I presented also the reasons, the, the mm -hmm. linguistical reasons, because comparing the test in, in, in Hebrew and the, the meaning of the Hebrew words, etc., etc., I, I argumented my position. But in the end, as Adrian said, the other choice, the other alternative has prevailed, yeah? And uh, it's a pity because uh, in the book, as you have seen, I, I have quoted exactly the words of the book. Mm, there is no, the, there is, you don't find this um, accentuation, yeah? The book is much more open yeah? and trying to contemplate male and female, even linguistically, I would say. Yeah? There is, I don't find this uh, discrimination in the book, yeah? It's the title that gives this impression, yeah? Uh, I have already received many uh, critiques of uh, Spanish <laughs> readers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Why? Why have you done this? Yeah. Yeah. You but know, yeah. you have, you have yeah. to to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's very helpful to to, to kind of stress that um, even if the title sometimes uses a particular word, that there's a real stress and a real uh, care to try and be sensitive towards that. I don't know if I've got kind of almost like a follow-up question um, related to that in terms of uh, readers again, uh, uh, particularly uh, women readers of, of this text, and not so much to do with translation, but more the biblical text itself. Um, 
So just this question here, is this document on biblical anthropology uh, one that will nourish the self-understanding and self-esteem of women as created in the image and likeness and wisdom of God? Uh, or does the patriarchal nature of these ancient scriptures found mm -hmm. gender equality? So it's not even just the translation, but this sense of we're looking at these ancient scriptures. Uh, so I know myself, a lot of the young women students that we have at the university worry about the kind of patriarchal language in scripture, not just the translation, but the, uh, some of the texts themselves. So, so just as a document for, for kind of women to, to read and engage with, um, as this sense of being created in the image and likeness of God, do you find there's plenty of material in this document to, to encourage and give hope in, in that regard? I think that um, the document goes in this line, yeah? At least we have tried, yeah? In this, the commission, I mean, uh, was very sensitive, yeah? And I think that if you pay attention to the way in which the foundational narrations yeah, all presented, you really find this space, this respect, this, uh, you know, um, for women, for the, because the way in which the creation, uh, creational texts are treated, yeah, uh, I like it very much, I must say the truth, yeah, and in somehow, somehow they are a little bit revolutionary, or they, or they mm, differ from some traditional uh, interpretation, yeah, to say that the woman comes from man, these sort of things that 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 mm. that, that, that you hear. So, in this part, I think that there is nothing, uh, mm, nothing to object, yeah. But if I am to be sincere, perhaps here I I I, I say my opinion clearly. <laughs> yeah. I am not so much. Um, I'm not so happy. I'm not so happy. I'm not so happy with, for instance, the omission of the prophetesses. Yeah, mm. because all of us we know that in Israel there were prophets, of course, and there were the most important figures, but there were also prophetesses. Yeah, and we have lovely stories. Yeah, uh, to deal with. Um, we have Miriam. Uh, Deborah was also considered uh, yeah. somehow a prophet. We have Hulda, especially Hulda, the prophet yeah. is Hulda. Uh, Noadia, even or even she's a bad prophet. No, doesn't matter. I mean, <laughs> I want to say, I want to say that uh, this, for instance, not this particular aspect has not been, you know, well reflected. Because if you remember the man of God, when you when you deal with prophets. Mm -hmm. You have the description of, of a prophet, yeah, and th there are some points in which, uh, in which I admit that I would have liked uh, more space, yes, it is. <laughs> That's great, but I, I, I think hopefully what that might encourage as well as for, for people, for students uh, and others reading this, that it can then encourage them to, to go further as well, once you look at some songs or you look at some of these texts, and then to read a little bit more in terms of studies and commentary, hopefully as well, to, to really enrich that. This can be a, a, hopefully a kind of a, a, I think it mentioned at the end, this idea of doors onto to various aspects of scripture. So hopefully these will be doorways into further study and further interpretation. Yeah. I've just got, I think there's time for one more question and then we'll have to close. So let me just read it to you, uh, Nuria. Um, uh, she said first of all, uh, this, this reader, thank you for this amazing presentation. Uh, and they said one of the most beautiful things they find in biblical exegesis uh, is the translations that arise from the Hebrew language, and particularly this idea of the heart, the lave that you spoke about in relation to the kind of vulnerability and the fragility uh, of human love. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, if you'd be able to say a little bit, a bit more about that in terms of kind of the biblical anthropology coming out of the Hebrew language, this idea of the heart, uh, and say a little bit more about that. One of our was, was very interested to hear more about that aspect um, of Hebrew kind of anthropology. Yeah, and this is very, very fascinating uh, topic now that I like very much is uh, uh, the anthropology, the Semitic anthropology uh, is a little bit different, yeah, of the one that, that we have. I mean, uh, for, for all Hebrews, yeah, uh, and, and for the Semite people, yeah, in general, because because this Hebrew anthropology comes from the 
uh, you know, from these countries surrounding Israel, from these cultures, yeah, Mesopotamia, Syria, and so on. So for them, um, all what is uh, related, yeah, to the um, to the heart, uh, to the mind, uh, to the will, yeah. All these we say emotions or feelings, yeah, uh, or or thoughts, yeah, or desires, all are um, um, linked, yeah, yeah. They are linked to the body. I mean, you cannot understand all these emotions and feelings without the body, because there is a strong uh, relation between. Uh, every feeling, every emotion, and your body. So, I mean, um, that's why in the Bible we found this um, anthropological um, language that has hundreds. I think that more than, if I am correct, more than 800 terms of the human body that appear in the Bible, yeah, and they do not only designate the, the, the organ, yeah, the, the vital organ, but they are used to express certain types of uh, inner feelings, yeah? To use the nose when you are, for instance, uh, uh, yeah. upset, yeah? This is typical, yeah? Typical is one of the clear. Or uh, the kidneys, yeah? Or when the heart or the womb, yeah, the womb. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's uh, it's this strong connection that for us is difficult to understand. Yeah, that uh, we are not a dichotomic uh, um, human being. Yeah, it's not that we have the soul going that direction and the body in that direction, and you try to put it together. No, 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 no. I mean, the uh, Semitic anthropology is monadic. Yeah, you. Yeah soul and spirit, uh, heart, uh, mind, uh, body, everything goes together, yeah, it's intertwined, yeah, you, you are uh, uh, one, only one, yeah, with all these aspects uh, uh, together, and this is, I would say, is the most uh, important uh, aspect, yeah, of the, of the um, Semitic uh, anthropology, yeah? You don't have a body, you don't have a soul, you are. Yeah. Or. Yeah. Yeah. That's mean, wonderful. You're a yeah. human being, uh, uh, and this is this is the point, yeah. And this is very much illuminating, yeah, because we are used to say, for instance, uh, mm, the mind is for the intellectual things, yeah. Mm. Uh, the reason, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the and the heart is for emotions, for romanticism, yeah, for all kinds, yeah, all, all what is related to love, and uh, for them not, for them not, for mm. them not, yeah. In the heart, you have the intellectual part, the volitive part, yeah, also the emotional part, but is is a unity, yeah, is yeah. all all together, all together. Yeah, that's fantastic. That says the integrity of the human person, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't this kind of dichotomy? Yeah. Different yeah. parts. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Nuria, for such an extraordinary uh, talk today, it, introducing us to the document, uh, the origins of it, and particularly the structure, um, so we can pick up now the book and work through chapters and understand the framework, understand how it's been put together. Um, and thank you, too, as well, for, for your suggestions about how people can dip into different sections and, and look at those in depth, because there's such a richness and a breadth of understanding in this work. Um, but thank you so much for your really enjoyable lecture. As I said, again, opening up the kind of fruits of the vineyard of the Song of Songs, a really wonderful okay. celebration of the text uh, and of understanding of kind of human love, opening on to transcendence and this relationship between God and human beings as well. Uh, so thank you so much for that. It was really wonderful to hear from you today. Um, and we wish you every success in your your new role as the Secretary of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, and we look forward to the next publication you'll all be working on together uh, in that regard. Um, for those of you who'd like to enjoy today's marvellous talk again, or encourage your friends to hear it, uh, the video recording of this will be uploaded very soon. Uh, so thank you again very much, Paul, for all your technical skills on this. 
uh, to the What Good News website. So the place where you've got the link today, www.whatgoodnews.org. Um, so once the live stream is finished, uh, within the next day or two, uh, the recording will be available. Uh, there's also a link on the homepage on the What Good News website today for those of you who now want to kind of go off and pre-order uh, the book, the document itself, through Darton, Norman and Todd. Uh, I think it's published next week, so you can kind of pre-order from, from today. Um, and as I said, this was the third in our little series of lectures uh, from the Catholic Biblical Association, kind of celebrating our 80th anniversary. Uh, we're hoping to have some more talks uh, in Zoom, maybe even <laughs> maybe in real life, or we can get back outside again uh, in the next few months. Um, so any of you um, who would be interested to hear more about future talks coming up, do, again, do please send us an email to catholicbiblicalassociation.gb at gmail.com to give us your permission so we can email you. Uh, but thank you once again on behalf of all the committee. Thank you, uh, Adrian and Javier and Victor, uh, and also for Paul for all your technical skills. But most of all, most of all, uh, thank you, Professor Nuria Calderon-Bernardes for just a really wonderful, enlightening uh, talk, encouraging us to go deeply into the study of scripture and this understanding of the human person, uh, female and male uh, together. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>